מגניב, לי קוראים שבי קורזן, אני המנכ"לית של הסדנה לידע ציבורי, וכיף לנו ממש לראות אתכם פה היום. אנחנו פה בפתיחה של האקתון שהולך להימשך גם מחר וגם מחרתיים של הסדנה, זה משהו שאנחנו עושים לפחות פעם בשנה. ומה שאנחנו עושים הפעם זה משהו די מיוחד, זה האקתון שלא רק מביא לכם את הפרויקטים המוכרים שלנו, שתוכלו לשמוע עליהם הרבה יותר בהמשך הערב, אלא אנחנו גם שמים דגש הפעם על תוכנית מיוחדת שנקראת תרבות פתוחה או אופן גלאם, ושהיא עוסקת בעצם לא רק בפתיחה, אנחנו בדרך כלל עוסקים בפתיחה של מידע ממשלתי ובלספר לאנשים על הכנסת ועל תקציבים ועל תאונות דרכים וכדומה. אבל אנחנו גם בפרויקט מאוד מיוחד פה, שעוסק בלפתוח מידע תרבותי, מידע היסטורי, מידע שמוחזק אצל גופים שונים שכולנו מכירים ומוקירים. ואז הרקתון הזה הוא בסימן של גם של הפרויקטים של הסדנה וגם פרויקטים מאוד מאוד מיוחדים שאתם תשמעו עליהם הערב. אז נחכה לנו גם ערב. נחכה לנו גם ערב מעניין שבו תוכלו אה, אה, לפגוש את האנשים אה, שמאחורי אה, אה, הפרויקטים השונים וגם לראות איך אתם תוכלו להשתלב אה, בהמשך וגם אה, יש לנו פה אורחת מיוחדת אבל לפני שנציג אותה אני רוצה רק אה, אה, להציג לכם כמה מהדמויות פה שכדי שתכירו ותוכלו לפנות אליהם גם במהלך אה, הימים אז אה, עינת שרון פה מובילה את פרויקט אה, תרבות פתוחה אצלנו ותבואו אה, דברו איתה, תשאלו שאלות אה, אודי ויניב פה מובילים את הצד הטכנולוגי של הפרויקט הזה, מרי רכזת לקהילה, כל שאלה שנוגעת להתנדבות ולפרויקטים היא הכתובת. וזהו, וזה נהדר שכולכם פה, אני רוצה שעינת תספר כמה מילים עוד על הכתובת פה, ואז אנחנו נתחיל לספר. טוב, אז באמת שאלו אותי כמה כדי להבין את ההקשר, השנה התוכנית קצת התרחבה מהשנתיים הראשונות שהיא פעלה, ובעצם היו לנו חמישה גופים שהשתתפו בתוכנית. הספרייה הלאומית עם פרויקט מאוד מעניין של אגדות פסח ושילוב פיוטים, מוזיאון בית התפוצות, מוזיאון לעם היהודי, שבעצם בונה פלטפורמה של אוסף מקוון לשיתוף עם קהל של חפצי יהודאיקה. סינמטק ירושלים לראשונה פותח את הארכיון של הסרטים בזכות אותם מפתחים שעבדו כאן עם הצמדים. רשות העתיקות הולכת להנגיש אוסף שעדיין לא נחשף לסיפור של פסיפסים. ולקחנו פרויקט קטן דמו של פרדס חנה כאיזשהו פרוטוטייפ לארכיון יישובים שאנחנו רוצים לבנות בעוד מקומות חוץ משם. ועכשיו I'm very happy to introduce ליזי יונגמה. ליזי is the former director, former data manager at the Rikes Museum and today she runs a very interesting project which is a national project in the Netherlands. She's going to tell us about the two projects uh, she runs and from her experience. Um, she, this is the first time of Lizzie in Israel, by the way. She just landed a few hours ago from Amsterdam. She was shocked by the weather. Um, and she's the only one who didn't freak out from the marathon tomorrow. Ask me why. Because she said, oh, just take the bike. <laughs> There's no problem, right? No. You cannot break that. Uh, so Lizzie is going to show us um, the two projects that I was telling you about. After the lecture, we'll have time for questions. And she'll be mentoring the hackathon tomorrow, so if you want to continue the conversation with her, she'll be with us tomorrow as well. Saturday, she goes back to you. Yeah. So please, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here tonight and inviting me to this beautiful and warm country. It's freezing in Amsterdam, so <laughs> I first had to take off three coats before I could climatize here. Um, oh, this evening I wanted to take you all on a little journey, the journey I took uh, over the last almost 20 years now. Um, I am a trained historian, I'm not an IT person, um, but I think uh, historians sometimes confuse mediums and goals. A book is never a goal, I think, for a historian. It's a, a medium to, tr to transfer a story. And digital can be another way to transfer, uh, transfer a story to an audience. And that's where my fascination for the digital comes from. I start my presentation with these eight images. Uh, and I don't think you will know them or recognize them. 
these are eight self-portraits by Corteseling. He was uh, one of the uh, resistance leaders during the February strike. He was arrested and sentenced to death. And for some reason, the Germans allowed him to have a pencil and a paper. <coughs> and while he was waiting for his death sentence, he drew his own face every day, sometimes two faces a day. And the day before he was sentenced to death, his wife got this as his uh, test his testimony. And these images are in the collection of the Rijksmuseum. The Rijksmuseum holds over a million prints, and this is part of their collection. And it's a hidden treasure, I think, at the Rijksmuseum. Um, something you can only show when you digitize this and tell the story of this person. And we actually did that in 2013. We posted some of these images on Wikipedia, and within an hour, someone wrote an article on Wikipedia about Corteseling, which didn't exist before. So for me, this was my first experience with transferring uh, something from an archive or a collection onto an open platform and see what happens with it. So that's why I wanted to share these images with you all. Okay, 20 years of digitization being summarized by the director of the v uh, the Museum. This was not a fun moment for me. I've been working on digitization <laughs> for 20 years. And uh, I won't comment on his statement, um, but the thing I can tell you all, and I, I think you will all know, is that there was nothing 20 years ago. We invented a new world. Um, t we all did together. Um, we tried digitizing things. I remember even before the internet existed, that we tested scanners. And we did it with Rembrandt prints, and I do apologize. I will never touch them again or put them on a scanner. But we, you know, <laughs> we had to test and we had to see what you could do with digital mediums. We didn't know anything about color management and so on. I will talk about it later for a bit. Um, but I still think, even <coughs> though the, di the new director of the v &A states that it was a waste of time and money, I think we needed all those years and all those experiments to come where we are currently, to see what happens when you digitize art, or to see what happens when you try and tell a story on a digital platform. Um, and that's what I've been doing over the last 20 years. And also, I always show this picture. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, this always brings on a lot of debates. Uh, are these kids bored or very hard working on the Rights Museum app? I leave it up to you. Um, I always show this picture because I think if glams ignore digital, kids will ignore art. Um, if I want a plumber, I go to the internet. I don't look in newspapers or yellow pages or whatever. If I want to know what's in a museum, I go to their website. If I want to know a story, I Google it. So, you know, if you ignore the digital world, you're ignoring your audiences. And I think the end of that process will be that you will be forgotten by the audiences because you're not digital. Um, so my biggest goal is to get everything online in a, you know, in a way that it makes sense to people. Um, so in the beginning, do you guys know this game? Who played this game? Oh, yay! <laughs> Two people. This, for me, was, this was the beginning of the internet. It was super cool. You could Google something and you would find one or two results. And Google Wack was a game. You would enter keywords and find one result. Not zero, not a thousand, but just one. Um, I don't know if anyone tried it for the, over the last couple of years. It doesn't work anymore. You never get one result. You never get zero results. You always get a thousand or a hundred thousand results. Uh, but it was fun. And it was this kind of fun that we started to digitize with at the Rice Museum. And again, we had to make a lot of mistakes before we started understanding the medium of digital. Um, these are two parts of the same painting, and beamers don't really help me here. Uh, can you see that there's a color difference here? So I always do this test with audiences. I always ask which one was recently digitized and which one is an old uh, first <coughs> beginner's digitization of this painting. So who says this is the new one? No. Who says this is the new one? Oh, I love you all. I love you all. <laughs> 
Most people think that this is the new one, especially in the Netherlands. Um, this is a digitization of a, a, a glass neck, a glass, uh, how do you call it, a diaphragm? No, it's a slide, a glass slide. One from the 1970s or 80s, and they turn a brown and orange. It's a, a disease with uh, photographs. And most school books in the Netherlands are reproductions of prints from the 70s and the 80s. So 17th centuries, a lot of uh, century paintings, a lot of times look yellow and orange because you know the the, the glass negatives were deteriorated. Uh, so kids think that this is the real image, and that's a really colorful one, weird thing. What is that? Whereas 17th century paintings are really colorful, and one of the things we had to learn when we started digitizing is color management. Um, we just started photographing them, and I still see a lot of photographs where there's, you know, fingers of a curator on them, and <laughs> you know, bars underneath them. So it took us at the Rijks Museum six or seven years to get the process fully controlled and to really make images that are good enough for this. Can anyone guess which painting this is? No. It's the Jewish Bride by Rembrandt. <laughs> it is, I, I don't even know how, how much pixels are in the image of the Rijks Museum, um, but we digitize it with such high resolution that you can, even online, you can see the paint and the scratches that uh, Rembrandt made with his knife. Um, and Rembrandt <coughs> is a very exceptional painter. In the 17th century, it was uh, en vogue to make paintings as hyper-realistic as possible. So you would use color, the, the proper colors. You would really make smooth paintings. And then there was Rembrandt. And he, he fought with everyone, and he was very poor, so he made his own um, paint. So you know, he probably used very cheap materials, so he couldn't make really smooth paint, but also he was very stubborn. So instead of painting very smooth, he was the Bob Ross of the 17th century. He started throwing paint at his paintings, and he started using his paint knives to carve in his paintings. And this is something you can't see in the museum. You can see this painting, but you can't see all of these details. And one of the cool things we did when we started digitizing at this high resolution was also put it online. And one of the reasons why we put the high resolution images online was that we had a, we, the Rijks <coughs> Museum still has a very stubborn director who said when we asked, oh, can we put the images online? He said, oh, put them all online, you know, and what resolution? Well, I want to be able to zoom in on them. He just bought an iPad and he said, you know, I want to see my images of my museum and I want to be able to pinch in on them. them. So this is where the open data policy of the Rijks Museum came from. It was Starko Dibbis who wanted to see his images on his iPad and I still love him for it. Um, so, but this is um, what we try to do at the Rijks Museum is find digital ways to have a real museum or even go beyond the museum's experience online. If you put things online, you don't want it to be, you know, a nasty downgraded version of the real thing in your museum. It's not good for the, your image as a museum or as a library and it's, it's not helping your audience. And, you know, if you have the high resolution image, you can also buy giving people a museum's experience, you can invite them into the museum. If you now know that you can really see the paint layered on this painting, you want to go to the museum and stand in front of this image and see if it's true or not and what it looks like in real life. Um, so, in 2012, at the Rijks Museum, uh, we talked to Taco Divitz about opening the collection and sharing it online. We were invited to a local hackathon in the Netherlands. Um, and he was very open about it. He said, just you know, put it all online, share it with everyone, and let's see what happens. Because that's the cool thing, I think, about a hackathon, is that there are people in a room that have you know, different experiences, different ways of looking at things, and have 
different questions than you as a museum's person have. Um, so for us, it, it just getting uh, the directors uh, to say yes was probably more complicated than opening the data for some re weird reason. W within six weeks, we built an API and we started sharing our data. And it was a really great experience because someone <coughs> in the audience built a, an app called the Faces of the Rijks Museum. And he used software, I think it's Facebook software, I'm not really sure, it can also be Google algorithms, to extract all the faces from all the paintings and some drawings. And then you could just see all the different faces, you could, so could zoom in on them, click on one and get the painting. And we, have a, we had a vast collection of paintings, I think seven or 8,000 paintings were in this app and you could see all these different faces that you had never seen before and you can even change you can uh, select people looking to the right or to the left and so on and it, it's it's it, you can say it's fun but it was a, a completely new way to look at our collection and it was really helpful to to start play with the collection digitally um, and at the Rijks Museum we love people playing with the collection so when we opened it up and we started sharing our images people started emailing us. We didn't even have a, a, an official upload part on the website yet, but someone started sending uh, us this email. And she said, I made a coat of the night watch, do you like it? And someone else made a necklace inspired by a work of art. Um, and we also, I don't know, have you seen the Rijks Studio of the Rijks Museum? Yeah, some of it. Some of it, okay. So, what we really liked was Pinterest. It was just out there and you could collect things and make your own board. And as a side project to the website, we said, oh, we also want a Pinteresty like thingy. It's now actually the core of the website, but it was just an experimental thing. Um, and people could, you know, collect their own images and make their own Pinterest like boards. We called them Right Studios. And this was such a big thing when the museum website was launched, suddenly, the, in the old website, people would stay on the website for like one or two minutes, look for directions to come to the museum. Is there a cafeteria? Where can I park my car? That would be the traditional way of people looking at the website. When we launched the new Rijks Museum website, people would stay 12 minutes on the website, which is enormous for a museum. And what they would, just start collecting images and go through the collection. So most people only made one collection, but even those people stayed on the website for 12 or 13 minutes. So they must have had a fun experience this one time. But there are also super users. There are people that build 20, 30, 100 different sets. There are also subjects that are really popular. Flowers, top score. It's the biggest thing on the Rijksmuseum website, birds and flowers, whereas the museum is about completely, you know, big national portraits and so on. But on, on the Rijks studio, people like flowers and people find weird stuff. There's a, a, a broom you can use to clean your fireplace. Someone collected 125 pictures of paintings and silver miniware for brooms to clean fireplaces or fire <laughs> place, so it's ridiculous. People use the Pinterest uh, part for anything. I can totally recommend it. Um, and then we were talking about this before. Um, the Rijks Museum started sharing its images in high resolution for free online. So the first question people started asking me is, <gasps> aren't you losing money? I was telling you this afternoon, yes, the Rijks Museum is missing, I think it's 200,000 euros a year in direct income. Um, but this is Heineken, you know Heineken beer? It's yes. a huge Dutch company. Mm -hmm. um, they like the brand Rijks Museum. The Rijks Museum gives away its images of its collections for free, but the Rijks Museum logo is super trademarked, so you cannot use it without permission or paying for it. And the new business model at the Rijks Museum is that you can use the collection for free, but if you want to be part of the Rijks Museum brand, you pay for the brand. And this is actually a much better business model. 
Uh, this, this works much better than selling an image for 45 euros and hoping someone is really paying it and having another department checking whether or not someone really paid for the image. Um, so I, I know that management of the Rijksmuseum was perfectly happy to give up 200,000 euros and find other ways to, get to generate <coughs> income. Um, so when we launched the, the Reich Studio, the Reich Museum website, the museum was also reopened. The museum was closed for 10 years and then the museum reopened, mm -hmm. um, which was a big thing, but I won't go into it too much. But open was just you know, the, the thing we wanted to do. So we started looking at other information in the Reich Museum that we also wanted to share with our audiences. And what I'm showing you here is part of pain sample research. I don't know who of you work in an art museum. Some, <laughs> do you do uh, conservation and pain samples and so on? <laughs> do you recognize these? This was it. Yeah, there's, yeah. What happens is, and curators tell me that they don't take paint off paintings. It drops off when they unframe a painting. I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know where they get the paint samples from, but they have paint samples of paintings and they do chemical research on it. And this is one of those departments in the museum that can be very hidden away doing weird stuff with microscopes and chemical things and no, no one else in the museum knows what it's all about. And they do things like this. So this is a microscopic recording of a paint sample. And the first thing I noticed was that uh, when these were taken, uh, usually they were printed with color ink on paper, and then they were put in a file, and it just said uh, yellow snippet on green, with green layer underneath it, but it would be, you know, 10 years later, it would be faded green with running through ink, and we were just clueless what was in the file, so we decided to re-record all the paint samples and try and explain to an audience what it is, so you're looking at different layers. And um, to do this, we had to uh, in reinvent the way you take pictures with a microscope, because microscopes aren't about uh, color trueness, it's just you record something you see. And in most research, it's not important that the blue is exactly the color blue that the part of the paint sample is, but with paint sample research, it's really important <coughs> to know that this blue layer is blue and not green. So what layer am I looking at and what are your conclusions about this layer? So we were digitized, we were, we even invented a new way to digitize uh, paint samples. We created this sh very tiny Pico card and you can contact the Rijks Museum if you're interested in it. Um, but I think there's a lot of data still in there about the way images were produced and the ways painters work that you can do a lot of cool stuff with. Um, so this project is still running. They're um, recording all paint samples for all paintings and hopefully they will launch this. Um, and I think this is another project, not done at the Rijksmuseum, but it also fascinated me. Um, this is a, a, a relational big data visualization. Uh, someone took all the data of all the exhibitions in, I think it's in Spain, and then connected all the artists just to see who was in which exhibition together with what other artists who was the curator at that time and how were their relations. And you can, there are certain artists that have huge networks, not even the most famous ones, uh, but you can just click on artists and see whether or not they have big connections. Um, uh, the female artists have other connections than male artists, so this kind of big data research can be done with museum collection information um, if you just are willing to share this kind of data with researchers. So that was the kind of research we were doing after opening the Reich Museum. Um, this is linked to open data. If you're interested in it, I will talk about it a lot more, but I, because of time, I will skip it a bit. Uh, but we were also trying to see if we could use keywords that the Getty is using and other museums are using, first of all, to automatically translate our collection. Their keywords are translated to seven different languages. We only use Dutch words. So if you link yourself to other, um, to other to Zorai, uh, you, 
you get free translation, so very cheap solution. Um, and then I switched jobs, and this is what I'm currently doing. I'm researching, or we're building a digital infrastructure uh, on the Second World War in the Netherlands. And we're interested in resources um, as a way to research the, what happened during the Second World War, where did it happen, who was involved, and when did it happen. Um, so, I changed jobs a year, year ago. I currently work for a Dutch infrastructure, so I'm totally sorry for the Dutch word. Um, but for me, it was a setback 10 years. Um, I start, we started harvesting, collecting open data from archives, museums in the Netherlands, small museums. And I was used to the very rich Rijks Museum collection. And then we got, and I really love this image, uh, but we would get, you know, very nice, but low resolution images. Uh, someone was very kind to describe a lot of things happening on this image and then attach one keyword and this keyword just states the name of the city where this picture was taken. Warmerveer is a city in the Netherlands. So we bought this very sophisticated system to connect all beautiful keywords we were thinking of collecting and we would only get Warmerveer, which is completely irrelevant for the story of this picture because this picture is about two men that led the resistance during the war and helped the Americans liberate Warmerveer. And they also um, attacked uh, the city hall, stole the administration. And the hilarious thing in this picture is that they, uh, they caught the, 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 the mayor that collaborated with the Germans and they put him in a carpet. So this is a long, detailed story about these men and what they were doing for the resistance. It has nothing to do with Wormervier. Um, so how can we improve this data to really tell a story about the Second World War when the data that you get from your local archives or your local museums is either poorly annotated or annotated for a local system where it's more interesting to talk about the city of Wormervier than it is to tell a national story. Um, we tried crowdsourcing, and again, uh, this is what we tried at the Rijksmuseum. This is Dutch, but this isn't. This is what happened when we got our audiences involved. Uh, usually we really love them, but this time we really hated them. Uh, there's some spam up there, and there's insults, and there's nonsense, and so on. So when we started thinking about ways to get the crowd involved in annotating our collections, uh, we first had to think about how do we get them involved and not get all this nonsense? How do we get relevant information from the audiences? Um, well, we found two ways. The first one is to exclude audiences and get computers involved. Uh, this, is the, this is the machine we're currently using to annotate collections. Um, so a company in the Netherlands was really nice. It's all algorithms, um, extracting strings, matching strings, and so on. But it's it's made available in a very easy way. So you don't need <coughs> to have huge programming skills to build your own uh, search engine. This is actually a search engine. Um, and the nice thing is that we can match the Zorai and resources on specific fields. We can weigh uh, the output of the matching and we can then send it back through the website as new and enriched data. And I'm sorry, again, it's Dutch, but instead of warmer veer, it now says uh, um, fighting forces, <coughs> a collaboration, uh, and uh, resistance uh, fighters, and uh, 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 city hall information. So now we have relevant keywords attached to this description based on this description. And if we have other collections that also use these keywords, then we can really start connecting them. So then we can connect uh, the images of the National Archives or of another local archive or even you know, other material, books or, or objects or whatever we can collect. Um, so this is the thesaurus we're building. To, this is actually the thing that holds the keywords that connect all the collections. And we, 
didn't just want to write a thesaurus as an instrument. Uh, a lot of museums have thesauri and it's just an internal instrument. For us, it's also a, an, an encyclopedia. So every keyword we put in the thesaurus, we also write scope notes for, and we use the scope notes and the images to explain the specific keywords to our audiences. So we really try, we're not just trying to use keywords as an external instrument to find the vases or to, to find it specific images, but really to help people navigate through uh, the subjects of the Second World War. And the cool thing about the thesaurus is, and I know you can't read Dutch, but as you can see, I enter a different word there than comes out here. We're using hidden labels and alternative labels uh, to match uh, the different ways people can describe an event with the name we use for the event. So we're really trying to think what the audience would think and then help them navigate through the collections. Um, and this is the input, uh, open data. This is a, a, a record from uh, the National Library. Um, thank God, over the last couple of years, uh, a lot of archives and libraries in the Netherlands started opening up their collections and implementing APIs. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do this five or six years ago. Uh, we estimate that 600 uh, institutions in the Netherlands have collections about the Second World War. Uh, we are currently harvesting 60 organizations, 60 collections of organizations in the Netherlands. And um, so it's 10% of the organizations that we would like to have in our portal site. Um, so I'm, I know there's still a lot of work to do, but I'm actually proud that this is the number we were able to get in year, year and a half. Um, and we're also doing another project. This is the people's portal that we're building. Um, we estimate that uh, 260,000 people in the Netherlands or from the Netherlands were killed during the Second World War. Uh, 100,000 and 102,000 Jews were deported and killed. Um, uh, 100,000. 58,000 Dutch people in all kinds of war-related uh, things. Uh, we collect as many inf uh, we collect as many archives or data that we can about everyone involved in the Second World War. Uh, currently, we have uh, 280,000 names in our portal, but a name is something different than a person. A name is just a name from one resource. What we're trying to do is find a range of resources about one person. And this person, for instance, is mentioned in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different resources. And we use these resources to recreate timelines for people. So when was he born? <coughs> uh, when did he die? Where did he die? Um, even what camp? To what camp? To what camp was a person transported during the Second World War? Um, so this is what a, a detailed record of a person can look like. Uh, this is his entire history. Uh, this is what we search, we know from resources. Uh, this is where we are still lacking information. And this again is his date of death. And this is also the route he took. Uh, and these are the resources we, uh, we used to recreate this story of this man. Um, and for us, this is one of the most beautiful projects we're doing because, you know, you're trying to give everyone a, a face and a story and a timeline and you're just trying to show the war from every perspective possible. And also, uh, we're creating, we're recreating all these different events, and see who else was on this transport, or who else was in this camp, and so on. Um, if everyone collaborates, and oh, is this no? Um, so machines can do a lot <coughs> with reconstructing the lives of people as long as you have data, uh, and this is where either machine or man can fail on you. Um, this is uh, an API that isn't working and then you're trying <coughs> to contact an organization and no one's there or no one knows about an API and so on. Um, 
So this is one of the biggest issues we have is that there are techniques, but th there's very little uh, knowledge about these techniques in museums and archives and so on. Another one, I always show this picture, I find it hilarious, is that technique isn't without flaws. So this is Adolf Hitler and this is Elvis Presley and according to, I think this is Pinterest, this is the same person. I, I find it a hilarious image, but this happens constantly. So we, we're looking at visual search, but this happens a lot. I have another one from a web shop where they recommend a man to buy a skin colored bra. I don't know why, it's a hilarious image, but you know, th these kinds of recommendation systems, a lot of them are still in their beta version. And when you deal with information like the Second World War, mm -hmm. You know, you have to be very careful in what techniques you're using and what recommendations you are giving to the audiences. Um, but I also have a lot of good examples of machines and what machines can do for you. Uh, this is the upload of the Rice Museum paintings <coughs> to Wikimedia Commons. Um, there is or was an automatic <coughs> upload tool for museums. I don't know if any of you have seen it or it uses it. Um, but you can automatically upload images to Wikimedia Commons and then other people can use the images from your museum or library or archive uh, as an illustration to an article. And so we uploaded our paintings. We forgot all about it until someone told me that there are statistics about the usage of your images on Wikipedia. And this is the Rights Museum. And I can't even pronounce this in English. Uh, it's 771 million views of images of the Rijks Museum since July 2013. I love the Rijks Museum website, but these are not the Rijks Museum website statistics. This is this you can only achieve this on Wikipedia, and. I don't, I don't think I have it, but there's another statistic and it shows you what are your most popular items on Wikipedia. And that's amazing too, because it's completely different to, to what your popular items in your galleries are. So the Night Watch is the most important image of the Rice Museum and everyone that goes to the Rice Museum goes to see the Night Watch. But on Wikipedia, uh, there's um, a painting of a canoe on a ship and it's supposed to be used for a film the, about a ship rebel. rebel. Yeah. So it's a, 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 a painting that is used as a book cover and a cover for a film in the 1950s that is the most popular one. It's not the highlight of the museum. Um, and even his all historical paintings that had large historical uh, descriptions were very popular on Wikipedia too. So. This could be a different perspective on your collection. Um, and then I come back to crowdsourcing. I already said we were looking into crowdsourcing at the Rijks Museum, but the first test, you know, we got all the rubbish and the spam and the, you know, the, the bad things from our audiences. So uh, we stopped uh, crowdsourcing, but just before I left, we wanted to see if we could find other ways to get the crowd involved uh, with our collections and give them a more controlled environment where they couldn't spam us, but you know we would really have something they could use and we would get something out of. And then for some reason we got in touch with a bird watching community. <coughs> and you know, co curators at the Rijks Museum know a lot about art, but they know little about birds. So for them, a bird is a bird, and they can, you know, they can differentiate a goose from a, I don't know, a sparrow, but that's it. Um, so we selected, um, I, I think, 10,000 objects that just had a title, bird at a pond, bird, bird, bird. <coughs> and the bird people went berserk. We had a Saturday afternoon, a hackathon, and it was, it was even on national television. There were people coming with their bird watching clothes on, even with their, <laughs> with their goggles, and they had to walk through the museum and they could point out birds on paintings, and then they would sit at a computer. And we built this uh, app that we called the Accurator, and it was super simple. And that's the thing I learned about crowdsourcing. If you get people involved in annotating collections is that your interface can really kill your project. Uh, so what we did was they would get 
an object and they would be able with a mouse to just draw a square and then a, a frame, a, 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 a field would pop up and they would be able to type the name of the bird and we would use a, a bird thesaurus as, a, as an auto suggest. So they would be able to click the bird that they were trying to describe, but they wouldn't be able to you know, put complete rubbish into the, the, the thesaurus. And th th I think in one afternoon they found, I don't know, five or 6,000 birds. And I got spammed for weeks from people, you know, give me more birds. Do you have things with birds? Can I please annotate more birds? <laughs> And this is what also happened. So, what we, <coughs> and my new job, I wanted to take this experience and do something else. Uh, this is at, uh, this is the original archive of Camp Vught. It was a concentration camp in the Netherlands, and Germans loved their uh, arc, uh, their recordings. So they have a huge archive of everyone coming in and going out of the camp. And it's both Jewish and resistance and um, um, criminal uh, prisoners in this camp. Um, and these cards, they were uh, scanned a couple of years ago, but then we just had a huge set of images of these cards. That was it. So we built a, a, a system for people to annotate these cards, so just transcribe these camp cards. Um, you could say that this part could be done by a computer, but the, most of the ink is really bad and there's a lot of scribbling on it and we wanted everything uh, annotated. Um, so we, we tried this with this camp. It has uh, 30,000 cards and we figured it would take us six months for them to transcribe the cards. We also wanted two people to transcribe the same card to see you know, if they would match. Um, Actually, it took them two months. Everyone went crazy over these cards, and people, you know, started. I mean, we had a comments field here. People started googling and doing research on the people they found on these records, and started sending us biographies and so on. Um, so it was a huge success, and we can now use this this original archive uh, for our people's portal as well, because this data was in an archive and no one has ever used it before. So currently we're looking at the police records of the city of Rotterdam, which has a huge uh, arrest card <laughs> data bank that we're going to digitize and transcribe. Um, so we're doing a lot of, I think, cool stuff to make as much data online available as possible and tell as much stories as we can. Um, but unfortunately, um, we're dealing with, I guess, the same problems that you're dealing with, and I always use this because these people look like lawyers to me. Um, mm -hmm. Because the biggest issue we've been dealing with is uh, legal issues. Mm -hmm. um, it started at the Rijks Museum with copyright. Um, everyone uh, was afraid of the copyright laws. Sometimes copyright laws are just <coughs> used to not do anything. Um, a lot of times you just don't know whether or not you have to deal with copyright or not. Uh, some artists are very keen on their copyright and in the Netherlands there are the artist representative organizations are very strict and really can haunt archives and museums and send <coughs> huge bills. Uh, so that was one big issue and still is one uh, big issue. And currently, and I don't know what the situation is like here, but currently uh, a big argu argument to not open data is uh, privacy laws. Uh, the EU is threatening with huge fines uh, when organizations leak or spill information that is privacy sensitive. Um, and I think these laws were meant for high schools and banks to be careful with my private data. But the weird thing is that a lot of archives and museums are terrified of fines and laws and privacy and now closing up their archives because of privacy laws. And I don't think the laws were meant to close up archives, but uh, a lot of archives that were online about people in the Netherlands are taken off over the last year because of privacy. So for me, as a historian, this is a huge threat 
because you can't do research if all archives are taken offline because of privacy laws. Um, and this is what happens. Um, I always show this picture. It says not available because of copyright. Um, the problem is that we can show images from the 17th century. There's no copyright here. But you can't show images from the 20th, 21st century online because of copyright. Um, so in the end, what will our children know about the last century? They will know that it had green squares and brown squares, but they won't know the artists of the 20th century. Uh, they will turn back to the 17th century, and that's not because the art is better or nicer, but it's because we show them 17th century and not 21st century art. So for me, this is also a big threat to the collective knowledge and memory of our children and next generations and that we really have to talk and do something about it. And for us, this is the biggest issue. They're not digitized. Most archives are not digital, nor digitized. Um, I think we only digitize 5% of all of our archives in the Netherlands. A lot of it is described in a very archival way, but people don't know how to get their data out of these systems. So they will stand there forever and you will never know what's in there. And I was this afternoon showing uh, the way you can find uh, information about Anne Frank. There's a lot of information about Anne Frank in our national archives, but you have to go to at least five or six different organizations. You have to know how their computer <laughs> systems work. And for instance, um, there, there are references to Otto Frank getting his business back uh, you have to know his full name, you have to know where his business was, you have to know how the archival system works, and then you have to send a letter uh, to get the information. So a lot of it will be forgotten. So our children will Google our past, and some of it is great, and I'm very happy that there's a lot of information online, but some of it, for me, is really weird. So this is Margot Frank. This is Anne Frank's sister. And she seems to be a movie star. And this is something that I'm always surprised with when I Google a person, is that there are always movie stars. Um, I, I still don't get this. This is a historical figure. And in Google, you first get books and movies about the person, and then Somewhere you will find related persons and then you will find a fuller story and historical resources. And I, there's one Dutch example of a Dutch uh, Suriname <coughs> resistance fighter who had a nickname Sunny Boy. Uh, so no one in the Netherlands knows his real name. He's always called Sunny Boy. And there's a movie, there's a book written about him and there's a movie made about his book. So if you Google for Sunny Boy or on his real name, you will find the book and the movie and you will not find the story of this real person that really lives and really has a beautiful story to tell. And that is something that really annoys me is that because these machines work with big data and we as museums and archives aren't producing big data, we're producing very limited snippets of information, uh, movies and books or whatever is winning this battle and our kids will think Anne Frank the musical and Margot Frank the movie star. Uh, it's a distorted way of, of the past. So someone pointed this statistic at me and I'm, I want to end with a very happy slide, not a very depressing slide. Um, archivists and museums can actually beat uh, news websites and big data and um, this is uh, the top 25 of Wikipedia for the week of uh, 23rd to 29th of October 2016. So just before the elections in America. And this was the most popular image on Wikipedia. And this is a painting in the Rijks Museum of Anthony uh, van Leeuwenhoek, a very famous Dutch uh, scientist from the 17th century. And I have to still figure out oh, it says, uh, was celebrated his discovery of little animals. He used a microscope and he discovered, discovered microscopic small bugs. Um, 
So thank God, in the week just before the elections in America, he beat Donald Trump. And I guess this is not fake news. So we can really beat Donald Trump. So let's all digitize, please. And so, and this is where I want to end with. Uh, for me, art and history matter. And when it matters, then you have to digitize it. For me, the digital is a new book. It's a way, a medium to transfer knowledge of the past to new generations. Um, com computer peoples have a tendency to make it very complicated because the technique is complicated, then the interface must be complicated. Let's keep it simple. Uh, let's get our users involved and put them in first position. Um, and computers are users too, so please, if you have a collection, open it up for others to resource it, uh, to reuse it, and then find other people like on Wikipedia that would not come to your museum's website, but will go to Wikipedia and then see what is in your collection. Uh, in your collection. And computers can do really cool stuff. Um, now again, we have to make beautiful and simple applications and we need big data and we, we're the ones producing it, the glam people are the ones producing it, so let's start produce it and when we produce big data, we can start doing amazing things with it and really find new ways to tell stories. Um, but we have to fight lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> I want you all to help us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lily, for this uh, fascinating lecture. And we now have some time for questions. So it's your time now if you have any questions. I, uh, first of all, it was really interesting and really inspiring. <coughs> um, but, but if I understand you correctly, then in the ideal world, if you succeed in your work, instead of uh, going, uh, having to fly to, to Paris and see the Mona Lisa, I can put on my VR goggles and see the Mona Lisa in, in, in a excellent resolution to the my, most many detail, better than I would ever be able to see with all the people, you know, and, and with, with all the glass walls surrounding it. So, in a way, I don't have to go there anymore. So what's the purpose of the museum? I mean, the physical museum, the physical buildings, I mean, what are they going to be used for once I have everything on, well, my, on my laptop, basically? Well, we actually call this the Mona Lisa effect because, you know, <coughs> in the 19th century, people started producing art books and the Mona Lisa was reproduced many times. Everyone had an art book with the Mona Lisa in it. And what do people do when they see a beautiful reproduction of a work of art? they go to the museum to see the real thing. And this is, I think, what happened at the Rijksmuseum too. We put the high resolution images online and we have, I think the Rijksmuseum now has somewhere between two and three million visitors a year, which is a tenfold of what the museum had before it was reopened. So the effects of putting your collection online in high resolution so people can zoom in on it and see all the details is that they want to experience the real work of art. So I don't think museums will ever close. Um, I think they will be more popular than they were before. Um, and I know in the Netherlands there was this one museum that had um, a natural history collection and on their website, on their front page, they had this fish that you know blows up when it's angry and it wasn't in the museum itself, it was in storage, and every day someone would come into the museum and ask for the fish. So if you put it online, people will come to see this specific object. So I do think people still want to see the original thing. Uh, but for instance, with um, Chinese, with uh, uh, plates or cups, uh, there's a mark underneath it that you're never able to see in a museum. You're not allowed to pick up a cup and look at the bottom of it. But there's a huge crowd that is interested in the marks underneath a cup or a saucer or wherever. So by putting it online, you can actually <coughs> you know, provide new information for your audiences. Uh, with the Rembrandt, you can, you, know, you can really zoom into the cracks in the painting. If you touch it, the painting in the museum, the guards will kill you. So you can do different stuff online than you can do in the museum. Uh, but I think online, even if I don't want it, it, it online still is a poster, a, a ticket to the museum. Um, but you have to be honest, Amsterdam is not in everyone's reach. Right. So my manager always said, I'm also 
you know, my art is also for people in Japan or in Tibet or in South America that will never come to Amsterdam. You know, should I block them too? So you get new audiences. Um, two questions. One is uh, what you just said is being recognized more and more by different museums around the world. The Smithsonian just launched a huge multi billion dollar endeavor to open up as much of their collections yeah. as possible. I mean, it's, it, you, were, you were the first, and this is fantastic. Um, I was wondering about, you were speaking about in the archival footage, that, in the archival uh, documentation that you're using crowdsourcing to digitize it. Did you, do you have a, how do you, how do you know that they're digitizing it correctly? Even though it's two or three or four people, I've, I've dealt with some some yeah. things like that before well, and this, this hard to understand a lot of times. So Yeah, well you should actually, you know, run a statistic query on it to see how many people you need to <coughs> come to an accurate transcription. Uh, these cards are quite simple uh, to type over. So um, after I don't know, a hundred cards, you know what are the default mistakes that people make and you can write another algorithm and some mistakes we take for granted. If people, you know, do a, 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 a cap with or not non cap we you know we completely ignore it if they put a dot or a no dot it's okay and it's a very it's a simple archive so but um if you are going to transcribe entire diaries or you know full text um we're looking into there's a project in luxembourg currently where they're testing uh, machines again to learn them to transcribe handwriting so we're still looking in ways to automate uh, digitization of journals because it's very complicated and it's also I think volunteers like these cards they're easy to understand is you know it's very you, it's, it's easy to do and it's very beneficiary for everyone but when you have to transcribe an entire diary of someone you know 700 pages it's I don't think it's very gratifying so we're, we don't know yet <laughs> First one is the how much DPI you have for the accessibility of the pictures? What? How DPI. much DPI? I, I can't even tell you how much it is, but the images at the Wright Museum are huge. You can, uh, on this is online version. Uh, uh, the I don't know how much DPI this, they were scanned. Um, no, I didn't. Okay. My colleagues at the image department will be able to tell you, but I know we had constant storage issues <laughs> because they were huge. Okay, the second question is uh, you're not afraid of that people will make commercial uh, purposes from the pictures? Um, no. Um, at the Rijks Museum, it was an issue if you published the name and the logo of the Rijks Museum on it. So you would, if you were selling yourself as a Rijks Museum. Uh, employee or as a rights museum sponsor when you're not um, but if people use the images it's fine um, just as long as you don't say I was commissioned by the rights museum and um, uh, we had run we had thought of all these weird scenarios you know what can happen can people build porn sites with our collection or you know do things that really hurt other people and uh, we figured that if people are going to do it, they're not going to, you know, officially download your images. They're just going to steal them from Google, uh, you know. So I, we, we never found a scenario or we never found anyone doing something really harmful with our collection and get the images through, you know, a download or the official way. <coughs> so uh, that's one thing. Um, Someone once built an app called uh, a nice tour of the Rijks Museum, and it wasn't a very nice app. <laughs> it was ugly, <laughs> and uh, but they, he didn't use uh, the logos and so on. And there was one local newspaper that reviewed it and said, "I don't understand why a nice institute like the Rijks Museum has a crappy app." <laughs> but in the app store, you could see where you use take publisher. You could say, "Mr. I don't know so and so from Enkhuizen." So, you know, it wasn't an official publication of the Rijks Museum and, you know, <coughs> other people publish things about the museum anyway. So we, you know, the museum is ignoring that kind of things. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, but it happens anyway. I googled for uh, the milkmaid, another very famous work of art of the Rijks Museum, and it's used a million times in different ways. I even found one where a cat was photoshopped <laughs> into the painting. You know, it's fun, but you can't stop it. So you can better join them than try and beat it. Um, do you have a statistic about? Uh, is is it more? Uh, uh, is it more damaging for the artist and whoever owns it uh, that people will laugh at it or people will share it? Is, is no, I don't have a. Do well, you find more data? I, I do believe that uh, there is this statement in. Uh, uh, in a, a, uh, what do you call it? Commercial ads and so on. That you, they should always talk about you. Uh, people in the marketing department say, oh, they should always talk about you. It can be positive, it can be negative, but they should always talk about you. So but I'm not sure if that's true for a museum. You do have, you know, you're, you're a respectable institute, so you want your image to be respectable. Um, but the Rijks Museum is, I think, the, the, and this is, you can find the statistics online, it's like the fourth or fifth trustworthy brand in the Netherlands. So only Schiphol, the air, Port, uh, Heineken de Beer and uh, a bank is more respectable than the Rijks Museum. So this is something the museum achieved over the last years is that it's fully recognized as a very respectful organization. So, Any more questions? No? We're going to take a short break. And first of all, thank you very much really for coming.